There's this great cliche, which is that when you go to watch a film that has been adapted from a novel, the film is never ever as good as the book. You know, it, generally, it kind of feels like it's true, right? Like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, amazing book, terrible film. Northern Lights, amazing book, terrible film. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One. I mean, that was just, everyone should be embarrassed about that really. The book was amazing, obviously, film not quite so good. And I started thinking maybe, maybe Hollywood takes good books and just makes them into bad films. Maybe a good book equals a bad film. Especially when you think about, actually, there are some books that aren't quite so good that do make good films, like Bridget Jones's Diary, an all right book, but actually a pretty good film. The Martian as well, I think, you know, the film probably was a bit better than the book, but it was an okay book, an okay book, amazing film. So maybe there is this thing that Hollywood ruins good books, but also maybe it just appears that way because of a statistical fallacy called Berkson's paradox. Go with me on this for a second. Let's imagine that there is no connection whatsoever. Of all of the possible stories in the world, if you plotted them on this as to how good a film they make and how good a book they make, actually there's no connection whatsoever. You've just got this, this kind of mishmash of dots, right? Like this. Now, the slight problem here, when you're looking at the data or you're, you're thinking about films that, um, that sort of answer this question, is that you are only considering a very small subsection of all of the possible stories, right? So you're only thinking about films that were good, so we're kind of up here. So this is where all the, the good films are. Or you're only thinking about good books, right? So books that are kind of down here. So generally speaking, the only ones that are sort of in your consciousness are going to be above this line here, all of these dots here. So either very good films or very good books. Why, Hannah? Why aren't we considering what's below that line? Well, because either a book is so bad that it never gets made into a film, or a film that's been made from a book is so bad that you never heard of it. You know, like Count of Monte Cristo. Anyone seen that film? No. It was terrible. <laughs> Absolutely atrocious. So it just isn't really in your consciousness because the film is kind of so, is so bad. So bad films we don't know about bad books we don't know about, or they don't even get made into a film, so we don't know about them. Exactly right, exactly right. But the end result is that you're only ever considering a very small subsection of this. On this, you've got films like maybe Harry Potter is down here, Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows. You've got maybe The Martian is over here, Godfather, that kind of thing. But you're not considering any of this stuff. So if you just redraw this graph with all the data that you can see, all the data that's sort of available to you. So bearing in mind, all of these stories here aren't really in your consciousness. It almost looks like there's this negative correlation. If you were to draw a trend line through this data, it looks as though Hollywood really is ruining books because it takes the best books and makes them into bad films. If these are the stories that you think about, all the books that are really good to the ones that are over here, if you kind of think about the average goodness of film of, of all of the books that are really good, it's kind of going to be around about here. It's like a mean mediocre film. Whereas if you're over here, these kind of mediocre books, and you look at the average goodness of the film that they make, actually they make pretty good films, right? So it almost looks as though the goodness of the book is negatively related to the goodness of the film, as though if you're a Hollywood exec, you want to try and find books down here, not very good books basically, to make those ones into films because statistically, they'll make your better films. It sort of doesn't make any sense. And it's because you're only considering a really small subsection of the population. So this here is Berkson's paradox. It was discovered by a guy called Joseph Berkson after he was working in hospitals and trying to collect data on the different diseases that people had and found these negative correlations between things that you wouldn't, um, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily expect. So let's say that you had diabetes and severe ingrown toenails, for instance. He went into hospital and found this kind of negative correlation, right? So here are your toenails and here are your diabetes. So this is kind of like how extreme your cases are. So more extreme cases are gonna be out here. So there were some people who had bad cases of both, but it looked as though if you had diabetes, you were less likely to have bad toenails. People with most diabetes, the worst diabetes, tended to have the best toenails. And likewise, people with the worst toenails down here 
tended to have, uh, you know, all right diabetes. But it's this negative correlation that actually isn't really there because, of course, in the whole population, actually there are all loads of people down here who have kind of not very bad toenails or, or not very bad diabetes, but they're just not the ones who are in hospital. So if you're only considering the people who are in hospital who are there because they have either bad toenails or bad diabetes, you end up getting this sort of spurious correlation between things that isn't really there. My favorite example of this is in Jordan Ellenberg's book, How Not To Be Wrong. And he talks about, there's that sort of old adage that very beautiful people are assholes. And that's another example of Berkson's paradox, but you can kind of take this one step further because on that example here, so if this is sort of good looking, so the prettiest people are gonna be over here and this here is niceness. So the nicest people are gonna be up here. And you've got sort of, again, you've got all of this data like this. In the real population, actually, there's no connection between them. You get nice people all across the spectrum and you get good looking people all across the spectrum of niceness. The thing is, is that if you are dating people, the people that you're considering, there's sort of a, a level of good lookingness that you, you generally don't go below and there's a level of niceness that you generally don't go below. So even though this is the whole population, when you're talking about the people that you would date, there is this line here. You're only really considering the people um, to this side of this line. So it looks like there's a negative link between niceness and good lookingness. If you're talking about very, very good looking people, the range that they have in terms of niceness is kind of the full spectrum. But the average niceness that they have is like somewhere in the middle, as in not very nice. But meanwhile, the ugliest people that you would consider going out with are actually only the people at the very top of this line. So they're only the very nicest people. So it looks like there's this downward trend, right? So sort of the average here is up here and the average down here is kind of oh, somewhere about there. So it looks like there's this downward trend. And with this example in particular, if you also add to this that the, the very sort of most attractive people of all are gonna be up here in this other triangle up here. So the very nicest and most good looking people are actually gonna be in this triangle over here and probably they're not gonna to wanna to go out with you. So these people are off limits to you anyway. All you're left with is this very, very narrow channel of people who you'd be willing to date and who'd be willing to date you. And that is definitely a negative correlation, or at least it looks like one. So just to prove that there isn't this negative correlation, this sort of secret negative correlation that, that Hollywood are, are, are ruining good books, I spoke to a journalist called Walter Hickey, who has done some analysis where he has downloaded the data for all of the films that he could find, which were both made into a film and were released as a novel. So he got the Metacritic score, which is kind of like a, a posher version of Rotten Tomatoes, essentially. And he also got the Goodreads score, which is, a, again, similar sort of thing, a user-generated score. So you've got the goodness of the book along the bottom and the goodness of the film along the top. And when you look at it first, it looks very heavily skewed, which isn't necessarily fair because scores on Goodreads tend to be quite good. Uh, tend to be quite high. People are quite positive about things. The scores there range between 0 and 5, whereas on Metacritic, they it's a percentage between 0 and 100. And the thing is, is that if you do finish a book and then take the time to review it, you're probably going to have enjoyed the book a little bit, right? If it's a really rubbish book, you just would put it down before you got to that stage. So this graph here doesn't totally represent the data very well. Instead, what you can do is you can use something called a Z-score, which is a little statistical trick that gives you a score of how good something is compared to all of the other data. And it kind of normalizes everything for you because you're a slightly more accurate picture of what's going on. So this here then, this is the real data here. You've got your goodness of your book along the bottom and the goodness of your film along the top. And actually you can see that if anything, I mean there's almost like a positive correlation, right? You've got lots of films over here that make both good books and good films. You've got some that make, I think this one is Up in the Air. I've never seen that film, have you? I don't know whether it's very good, but apparently critics loved it. Godfather, I think, is one of these. The data's generally actually quite spread out. You certainly haven't got this, this negative trend. The only thing that you don't see here is that sort of these, these gaps over here. And that is because, of course, very bad books never get made into films. Whereas with the good looking example, you wouldn't date people who you didn't consider either nice or good looking. You know, people don't read bad books 
but they do watch terrible films. So if the book was better than the movie, then you would want your data to be all down on this side, right? So if you had a diagonal line, anything on that side of the line would be the movie is better than the book, and anything on that side of the line would be the book is better than the movie. And actually, so there's the line there. I mean, it's maybe a bit skewed. The, often the book is better. Thing is, at the very beginning, when we're thinking about that sort of almost negative correlation, people just don't remember all of these films um, or all of these books that, I mean, the ones in this, I've gone through the data, I didn't, I've never even heard of most of them. So when it comes to famous films and famous books, that's when you get more of the book is better than the film. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Or at the very least, when you get famous books and famous films, it's like Hollywood ruined the good book. But they didn't. There's a lot of bad books out there. Yeah. Not yours, though. No. You know, the debate about books versus movies is irrelevant to me because I think the perfect compromise is an audiobook. And Hannah, who you just watched, she's got a brand new book out. She's recorded it as an audiobook. And I went along and she recorded some of it. The book is called Hello World, How to Be Human in the Age of the Machine. People are less tolerant of an algorithm's mistakes than of their own, even if their own mistakes are bigger. Hannah's book's already getting great reviews. It's been nominated for a really amazing prize as well. And I tell you what, it really comes to life when you hear it read by the author herself. Hannah's got such a great voice and gives it so much personality. The algorithms that silently follow us around the internet, the ones that are harvesting our personal information. The best place, of course, to get your audiobooks is Audible, and they are the supporter of today's episode. If you go to audible.com slash number file, or text the word number file to 500, 500 you can start their 30-day trial. With that, you can download a free book. You can download any book, but of course, I'm going to recommend Hello World, Hannah's new one. Definitely worth getting. Well, the thing is, actually, you don't really read your own book. I mean, the first time I read my own book was when I was doing the, the audio book. Because, I mean, you, you're sort of like doing little bits here and there. Um, and then, you know, you, you never have a chance to sort of sit down and read it all in one go. So that was quite nice, quite reassuring to know that actually as a book it does work, <laughs> rather than just these disparate chunks of text that are mashed together. Audiobooks are great when you're lying in bed, going on a long road trip, walking the dog. I love listening to them, and I think you're going to really enjoy Hello World. Audible.com slash number file for the trial, for the free book, which can be Hello World if you want it to be, or text number file to 500-500. Our thanks to them for supporting this episode.